figs, you know, in south of France, figs are free. You yeah. go and walk <laughs> in the countryside and you just pick some, uh, some figs on the tree and you eat them on the spot. Bonjour, this is Fabulously Delicious, the podcast that's all about delicious French food and the people that love it, cook it, produce it, talk, write and photograph it. When you mention you're going to France uh, or that you live in France, people always recommend a chateau, a view of the Eiffel Tower or a restaurant. But the one thing for any foodie that people will always recommend is a good food market. It's as French as cheese and wine or champagne. Today, I'm joined by someone who loves food markets so much that when they moved from France to Australia, they ended up creating their own. Sylvain Coulon, welcome to Fabulously Delicious. Bonjour, Andrew. Thank you for having me today. Now, let's get stuck into it. You were actually, um, I want to go back to your childhood. You were actually born in Paris, but you grew up in one of my favourite places in France, and that's Vence, uh, down in Provence. Is that yes, correct? Yes, so I, I spent um, most of my life in south of France. I grew up in Vence. I spent about um, 13 years there with my mother. Amazing. So what was like, like life like as a child in Provence and the Côte d'Azur? Oh, I would say it was very sweet. Um, you know, I was just, I used to walk to the school and just, it's, Vence is a small village. So, um, you know, we, we had like a big uh, mimosa tree in my garden, a massive mimosa um, What's the name in English? So mimosa, for those in Australia, it's a wattle, we call yeah, it. Yeah, the wattle, wattle, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. it, yep. That one brought to, I don't know if you know the story, but um, it's a native Australian tree that was brought back to France by Napoleon as a gift for Josephine for his wife. We. Oui. You know? Yes, that's right. She was, she loved uh, all things uh, Australian. Exactly. So in South of France, there's a lot of mimosa. I mean, in my garden, I, they had this massive, very old um, uh, wattle tree. And I used to play, you know, in that tree all afternoon. That's the scent of my childhood because in South of France, there's mimosa everywhere. If you go to Menton, if you go to on the coast, you know, it's um, everywhere. Vance is uh, also known for, I think it's uh, Matisse. It's a very artistic area with Saint-Paul de Vence, you know. There's a lot of art galleries, a lot of uh, pottery, um, like artists, ceramic, um, a lot of painters, street artists. And there was a little market as well in the, in the center of the old town in Vence. And I remember my mom had one of her friends, because my mom was in the fashion industry. She always uh, was after like silk and unique fabrics that she would buy on the markets. And she had one of her friends who was a very loud uh, older lady and she was selling on the market. So I remember after school, I was walking back to school by myself and I was always stop on my way back. <laughs> Um, and to say hi and see her on a, on a market, market stall. She always used to give me like a, 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 you know, a dollar, like a franc, or give me a lolly, or go, go and buy me a cake from another market stall. It's, you know, that's a strong memory from my childhood, this little market just in the historic center of the city. Provence is a amazing place for food what are some of your favorite foods from there look my favorite food i'm i'm very about like fresh fruits and you know tomatoes melons the mix because there's a strong um, influence of uh, italian um, cuisine but also uh, north africa like uh, moroccan cuisine with spices um, so south of France is a blend of, of all these Mediterranean influences. And um, I remember in, in, in summer having some uh, rock melon with uh, Italian prosciutto and port. Like even as a, as a kid, <laughs> my mom used to give me a little bit of port on my melon because that's how we used to, uh, okay. to, to eat it, Right, you know. <laughs> I've always wondered that, actually. At what age did you start drinking as a French person? I think when I was a little girl, because every summer I used to go on holidays in uh, the Loire Valley with my uh, grandmother, and she used to give me a canard, you know, when you, you dip 
uh, a piece of sugar into um, alcohol, like 70% <laughs> strong alcohol, you know, and you drink, you, 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 do, you can do that in your coffee at the end of lunch, but you can also dip it in uh, the digestif, you know, like prune alcohol or cherry alcohol. And so that's when I started. Um, and then my aunt, who was a very fine um, connoisseur in red, red wine, so uh, my aunt was married with this um, very extravagant uh, person. He, used to, he was famous in the 60s. He was a um, racing car uh, driver. So he was very extravagant, and he was um, a connoisseur with red wine. And that's why I only drink red wine. So he was the one that introduced me to good wines when I was about 15 years old, just teaching me how to recognize a good wine. And we used to drink the, the good wine with a truffle because my aunt is an amazing cook. And they used to live in Grignan, you know, in Grignan, where there's a black truffle market. So yeah, we, we used to go to the black truffle market and um, they would cook amazing meals with fresh truffle, like scrambled eggs, pasta. You studied as a young adult, but not in the food industry. Is that right? What did you study at school? No, not at all. I studied law for five years, international and uh, European law. Yeah. Well, why was that? I have no idea. Seriously, like I had no, it's, it doesn't make any sense when you, you know me because I'm a very creative person, really. Um, I think I, I didn't really know, you know, back then, um, there was not all this follow-up about what would you like to do or you just needed to have a job and make money, you know. So my mom told me, oh, maybe you should study law, um, you're smart, you'll do it. And I just wanted to be a good girl. So I just did my five years of law, you know, had my, uh, my master and, um, and then just change directions because it was not me at all. So what is university life like in France? So I, I've just got it um, pictured in my head that it's long, three-hour, four-course lunches. But I have heard that this is the case, that uh, students get a, a very good cafeteria lunch in, at university. Is this correct? Absolutely. Yeah, I remember you have the restaurant universitaire. Right. Which... The, the university restaurant where I remember it was like maybe three francs. So I don't know, two bucks. Yeah. And you would um, just be able to choose a starter, a main and a dessert and some cheese. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> it was so cheap, uh, which is amazing, you know, because that's, that's the good thing about France and French education is that it's free and it's accessible to everybody regardless of how much money your parents are making if they can afford um you know to pay for studies for you and so basically everybody was going to the restaurant universitaire because there was no point cooking at home so um before we talk about your move to australia and markets in particular french markets um i wanted to ask you about your family now you touched on your your mum before and your auntie uh you mentioned to me and i hope you don't mind me saying this and i hope your mum doesn't mind me saying this but your mum wasn't the best cook but your auntie was and um you had a nickname for your mum that you said something in france what was that Look, I'm sure my mom won't. She, my mom doesn't speak English, so hopefully no one will translate the podcast for her. She, I'm sure she, for, she will forgive me. Sorry, maman. Um, so my mom was actually a pretty bad cook. She, she had the reputation in the family to burn um, stuff. And I remember she was cooking me the worst steak. It was hard as rock. And I would just hide it under my chair or give it to my dog. Yeah. And um, my aunt, her sister, which find the nickname was the Cordon Noir. Cordon Noir. <laughs> cordon Noir, I not Cordon Bleu. No. Um, I'm not even sure if, if my mum is actually aware of that nickname. 
We okay, might find well. out today. Yes, I'm sorry. not sure if she's going to like it. Oh, she used to try all sorts of recipes and it was always a catastrophe. That it was really looking bad. Or, but my aunt, her sister, was right the opposite. She was the best cook. So my mom did, didn't really actually pass on to me the the way of cooking, you know, the, the reputation about French people. Or you guys are all uh, amazing cooks. Not at all. But my aunt, my aunt, she's just, uh, she's really an amazing cook. Amazing cook. So your mum, where was she from? Was she from Paris? My mum is from actually Vierzon. So in the center of France, you know, uh, Loire Valley. Um, and she moved to Paris. Um, she worked in the fashion industry as a petite man, you know. She's, she worked for Yves Saint Laurent, Chanel, Givenchy. Yeah, she's a, she's a very uh, talented um, dressmaker. And um, yeah, that's how she moved to Paris. And that's why I was born in Paris. Your father used to sell, um, or does he still, I'm not sure, uh, sell antiques. Is that correct? Yeah. So my dad's been selling on market um, all his life. So when he was uh, in his 20s, he used to sell um, linens and beddings in Paris. And now he's um, antique and old books, um, um, like bric-a-brac. Um, oui, so brocante. Broker. Yeah, brocante in, um, in Loire Valley. So um, when I go back to France, I always go and spend a day with him at the markets and just sell with him on the market it's amazing you know it's um it's just a family family things because um i don't know if i told you but my uh, great great uh, grandmother moved moved from poland um uh, in 1920 uh, she was a Jewish and she moved to paris and she was um hand making some uh, scarves and um, hats, socks that she was selling on the markets in Le Marais, Rue des Frambourgeois in Paris. Yeah, so she was, uh, she had a strong uh, Jewish accent, um, my grandmother told me, and she was selling on the markets in Paris, just things that she was uh, making herself. Yeah. And so then it's sort of a family tradition to be selling at markets and have uh, something involved in markets then? Yeah, I only realized that about a few years ago, you know, because when I looked at my family history, I was like, that's that's very interesting. And there was always a very strong, um, there was always a link, something with the markets. And everybody in my family is mad about markets, like brocante, um, you know, bric-a-brac, fabrics, shoes. I owe my aunts, like, they spend their weekends uh, wandering around markets and um, vide grenier and me, me the same. And my daughters are the same. Like they love markets. I've moved to France, obviously, and I'm one of the, I think it's something like about 5,000, 4,500, I think, Australians have, have moved to France and are living in France. But I think, from my understanding, it's something like 20-odd or 30,000 French people have moved to Australia. So there's obviously a lot of Australians want, sorry, a lot of French people want to go live in Australia. So when did you move to Australia and, and why did you move to Australia? Look, you would have told me uh, even like 10 years ago that I would end up in Australia and make my life here. I would have said, no way, no way, because... I just uh, fell in love with an Australian rugby player, okay. <laughs> Montpellier, <laughs> you know? Right, uh, right. It's like in a, in a movie, a little bit in a romantic movie where I, I fell in love with a rugby player, Australian, and we, we spent eight years together in France. But it was a bit difficult for him because he couldn't speak French very well. And, you know, France is not as easy to find a job when you're not a... A local. Spent nine years in France. We had two daughters together and then um, it was just be getting a bit rough in south of France. So we thought, why not? Why not trying to go and live in Australia? So I arrived in Australia um, eight years ago on the 1st of January 2013. Right. 
I celebrated New Year's Eve in the in the airplane, which was quite depressing. <laughs> <laughs> With the kids. With the kids, uh, they were like sick, you know, babies. Oh. I was by myself. I was depressed. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, I had left my my entire life behind. My, I mm. had a, an amazing old house in Nîmes. I was working a corporate, very corporate, serious job. Um, you know, I just left everything and start from scratch again. Did you do that? Did you go into law in Australia or? Um, look, I left France not knowing what I would do in Australia, to be totally honest. But when I came here, because I was working with um, startup and small businesses, helping them to to set up their business in France. So I had the experience of uh, small businesses. And when I came to Australia, I was like, look, now that you, you left everything, you're better off maybe starting your own business and just do something totally different, um, take the opportunity. So um, when I arrived, I started a French linen business here. Um, so with the connection with my mom and the fabric, so I... I created a business where I'm designing um, a, a range of um, French linen, homewares, tablecloths, aprons, tea towels, cushions, and all the fabrics and the products are handmade in France. So I've got two workshops uh, working um, for, for me and handmaking everything for me and sending it to Australia. So that's how I started. And I started to sell my products on the markets. Now, actually, whilst you're here and not on the subject of markets, but you can help explain something to me. Now that you've mentioned tablecloths, I often see at markets, especially the Bastille market in, in Paris, but also at the supermarket, there are big rolls of things that are like plastic and people, what? They're tablecloths or something. They roll them out and. The toile ciré. What is this? The, the plastic. Uh, it's it's toile ciré. So it's a it's a plastic. Uh, it's a thick plastic that you put on the top of your table just for every day. Um, ah, so instead yeah, of using so you, a tablecloth, you put this on. Yeah, it looks pretty. It looks okay. It's not pretty to entertain and have a chic dinner. But yeah, the toile ciré is like a big thing in South of France. So you just go to the shop and you cut yourself whatever, two or three meters that you need. It's very cheap and you put it on your table and it lasts for years. <laughs> you just wipe it off. And uh, and um, my grandmother used to have a toile ciré. It's very French. It's very sticky when you... When you eat and you sit at the table, you yes, usually have imagine. your elbows <laughs> stay stuck, you know? Yes, I thought about this because I've always thought that there's lovely linens in France and things. And then and then when we actually moved to the countryside, we bought the, the house in the country and our lounge room is quite big and has three metres high uh, windows. And there was these curtains there and they were made of plastic. And I'm thinking, why is the tablecloths and the curtains plastic in front? <laughs> That's good. You've explained that to me now, which is uh, which is fabulous. All of this then, when you started the linen business and, you, and things have led up to Le Marche, right? So what is Le Marche and where is it? So I started, the, the, just to make it short, to, to give you the feedback, is when I, I started working in events when I was 18 years old in Paris, so I organized my first event when I was 19. I organized like a university end of the year, huge party in a club. And it was my first event. I drew the poster myself and I went to organize a catwalk in the, the club and it was packed. It was a big success. I remember the owner of the club came at the end of the night and gave me a big envelope full of cash <laughs> to thank me. I was 19 years old. I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. And then from there, I started to work in events. So I did, I worked for events agencies, did work for um, Chanel, um, catwalks. Um, I worked with big traders, like, you know, big caterer in Paris. And that's how I, I started working in events. So I've been working in events for a long time and I loved it. I fell in love with events when I was in Paris. So when I came to Australia, I started to work on markets and then through friends who knew I did events in the past, 
they had a few events to run. They said, do you want to do it? And I slowly went back to it. And I organized a big Bastille market. That's how I started in July. And um, very successful where I gathered like French food only and French artisans, um, handmade products from France. Um, and last year during COVID, because we had these four or five months where everything went dead, sorry, I just dropped my glass. <laughs> I had time to reflect on what I was doing and just step back. And where I was living, there was no uh, fresh food markets anymore. There was this big gap. That they used to have a big market in the North Shore of Sydney. And um, this market moved and the whole area was left with no food market. I thought maybe there's an opportunity just to start a new market with a French twist. Because I could see that with my Basti market, people really enjoyed it. Um, people loved the, the French food. They love having um, the, the, the opportunity just to connect with French foodies, buy French food, authentic, with artisans that were telling a story as well. Absolutely. I mean, in Australia, you've got so many, you've got a love affair really with France and its markets. I mean, you have the Brisbane French Festival in in July. It's well, I think it's like twenty, thirty thousand people go to it over the course of a weekend. You've got you did have the Paris to Provence Festival in November in Melbourne. You used to attract uh, tens of thousands of people. So it, there really is a love affair there with with France and its markets in Australia. Absolutely. I think there's a, there's a love affair between France and Australia. Like in France, when you speak about Australia, people are, it's like, oh, Australia, it's so far away. It's, people have this image of Australia where it's beautiful. It's a destination. There's something, you know, there's a connection. French people love Australia and Australian people and the other way around. Australia now loves France and and the food and the culture and the language it's it's amazing so um when i did my basti market i saw that i saw that how people were enjoying that that opportunity to spend a day in france spend a day in a french market speak french dress french wear a beret have a chat you know how australians are so friendly and open for that le marché i thought because I'm, I'm Australian now as well, I became Australian last year. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought there, there's an opportunity here to create something different, a market that would um, um, re, re, um, reunite. reunite? Oui. Is that correct? Yes. Is yes, that yes, reunite? Yes, yes. Sorry, excuse my yes. English. No, it's um, perfect. The, the, the best of, uh, I wanted to blend the best of the two, my two countries, you know, because I always say, even if my heart belongs to France, now I really feel like Australia is home. I, I feel like that's, that's home. That's my heart, home. I'm very grateful to live in Australia. I love it. And I saw there's, a, there's an opportunity to um, blend the two countries and the best of the two countries. And so I thought it um, would be amazing to create a market with Australian farmers and beekeepers and artisans, but also getting all the French foodies in there. And so was it hard to find providers of and people that are making French food or, or bringing in French food in Australia for the market? Over the eight years where I did my markets with my French linen, I met a lot of people. So I built up like a strong network of French people doing markets and French foodies. And so I, I met these guys and I worked with some of them for so many years. And so they started working with me for Basti markets. So when I, they know how I work. They know the type of events I, I create and the type of atmosphere I want to create. And so when I said, look, I'd like to create Le Marché, they were in. Like they were all in, which is amazing because they trusted me. Um, and 
I, I feel very grateful because I've got an amazing team of uh, unique artisans and foodies. Each of them bring something different with their personality, their approach, their history, um, the type of food they cook or they import. Um, so it was not too hard, actually, I have to say, but because I've built up the, the network for over like eight years. Getting into markets and particular outdoor food markets in France, how often does the everyday French person go to a market? Oh, yes. I mean, in France, you there, there's markets every day of the week, really. I remember going to Wednesday morning market with my grandmother in south of France. And there's always, always a market somewhere. It can be a food market or it can be a, but a lot during the week, actually, probably a little bit more than in Australia, um, where people go to the Friday or Thursday or Wednesday food market. It's, it's really part of the, the culture, but it's also a place where the community is meeting, where you see your neighbors, you know the people that sell the food. Um, you catch up, you sit at the terrace, or you call your friend and say, hey, let's catch up uh, on Saturday morning at the market. Let's have a coffee. I mean, it's like that a little bit in Australia. I think it's, it's, it's growing like that, but it's, it's really the village. It's the, the heart of the village life, I feel like. The market is the, the heart of the, the village where everybody's meeting and connecting. And that's what I wanted to create. Can you describe a food market in France for somebody that's not been to France? What are we going to find at the market? Well, you would have like a butcher, mm -hmm. you know, in a little um, kind of van, like an old school 70s van that opens up at the front with um, amazing meat. You would have certainly a couple of uh, cheese stall, not only one, but a few usually specialized. So you would have like a good cheese stall and another one that's going to be more, they, they, they have their specialties. Um, of course, a lot of farmers with um, fresh um, fruit and veggies. There's um, also what I like in French market is there's usually a, a couple of older people that have their own little garden. So it's not their job, but they have a little veggie patch and they come and sell their, their fruit and veggies at the market. So they usually have like a table with a basket of tomatoes and a couple of potatoes, um, flowers, fresh flowers, uh, a little bit of everything. And are usually the best <laughs> fruit and veggies. Um, but people would specialize. You would have someone selling only um, melons, for example, in summer. You would usually have a knife sharpener. They're usually not big markets. There's not too many stores if you go to a little village. Um, I remember my grandmother market, they had maybe, I would say, four or five stores. <laughs> Enough, you know. And would you go to the market then when you had the young kids? Is that something you would do or is it, um, is it not part of the younger generation or modern life now? Um, is the supermarket too convenient? Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I used to go to markets all the time, every weekend for food or bric-a-brac or brocante. Or, and I used to take my kids with me and... And um, that's it's part of the, the routine, the family life, you know. Or even if you drive somewhere, you know there's a market, you stop and you go, oh, let's go and check the market. How important is local produce at a market? It is important because uh, in France, um, depending in which region you live, you, you're going to find specific products. So, for example, I was saying in Grignan, there's a very, it's one of the most famous um, black truffle markets at a certain time of the year where you know you have to go very early in the morning. And what happens is people um, bring their car and they have in, in the boot at the back of the car, they open the boot and um, they have a basket covered with a tea towel and they, they show the black truffle and you go and buy it and it just sells like for three or four. 3,000 uh, euro a kilo and they just sell like that 
you know. Uh, my grandmother market, it was more about the good cheese and it's a specialty of where she is in the Loire Valley where you go and you buy the, the good cheese. My mum, where now she lives in Valence, um, it's going to be the abric apricots and all the, the, the fruits from the Valley du Rhône, you know, apricots, prunes, cherries, the scents, the flavors, it's like unique. Um, if you go to Cavaillon, you're going to buy some melons. If you go to Nice, it's going to be the flowers. So it's, it's very, the, the, the importance of local products is each region will have a specialty. If you go to Toulouse or to the west of France, that's when you're going to find the foie gras and the pâté and the heavier food. You know, as if you go in Nice, it's more the fresh food and the herbs and uh, condiments and things like that. At the moment, cherries everywhere here in France and blueberries as well. Just this morning, actually, at the market, the blueberries, it was half a kilo for 10 euro, which is a pretty good price. And cherries, I've never seen cherries at more than, I think, maybe 10 or 12 euro maximum. But I know that this is not the same in Australia. I mean, when cherries in, in season in Australia, you can be paying $35, $40 a kilo. Sometimes they're quite expensive. Was that a shock, how expensive things were? in Australia for those sorts of everyday, yes. what would be everyday things for you here? Big shock, big, big shock. The price, um, like like you said, the cherries or the figs. Oh my God, figs, you know, in South of France, figs are free. Yeah. You go and walk <laughs> in the countryside and you just pick some, uh, some figs on the tree and you eat them on the spot. Here, you pay like, what, two euros, two dollars for one fig. Or oh, the cherries are so expensive, apricots. And I don't think there's a big variety also of fruits. Like, uh, look, don't get me wrong, I love Australia. I'm very grateful to, uh, to live in Australia. But I find that the vari variety of fruits are, is not great. Um, but also the taste I, I, there's something that I don't get because we are in a warm and sunny country and, and the taste of abricots or prunes, it, it's just not the same. It's not as fruity and sweet and like just the scent of it, you know, and the price, 100%. Strawberries, you know, um, in Nîmes, where I spent uh, 10 years, there's a gariguette. I don't know if you tried the gariguette, the strawberries. So it's a special fish, yeah, from the, the gar. Uh, it's a tiny um, um, strawberry. Uh, it's not, it's a light red and it's very, very sweet. It's a little bit hard and very sweet. It's delicious. The scent, you, if you have a, a bowl of gariguette in front of you, just the smell, the scent is like, wow. You lived in Provence and we mentioned, as we mentioned before, and Julia Child um, writes about this in her book, My Life in France. She writes about the markets in Provence and the amazing seafood and, and things that uh, were available to her there. How different is the market in Provence to the rest of France? In Provence, if you go to a market, there's a lot of vendors, a lot of stores. So there's an abundance of stalls and even just visually when you walk to a stall in to a market in for example in nice or um, in the countryside somewhere in provence like aix-en-provence or marseille or martigues just visually you arrive and there's this abundance of um, fruit and colors you know all these stalls and the noise as well because people are very loud <laughs> you know in marseille when they sell the seafood it's like super loud they're known for that um you know la vente à la crier but um the abundance of like visually the colors and the scents that's for me that's that's a typical south of france market where you arrive and there's all these amazing vibrant colors like orange and yellow and the lavender and you can the, the smell like of the spices because there's a lot of people um, selling also the spices. I don't know if you've been to Arles, the market in Arles. Ah uh, oui, yes. 
Well, I mean, it's just like you need you need a day to walk through the old market, right? Yeah. So there is a bit of everything, but when you go into the food section, for me, the, the sense, I'm very sensitive to sense. So for me, it's something very strong. Um, it's just a mix of all these scents of lavender and spices and basil and uh, olive oil and marinated olives. That's for me, that's the market in Provence. When we can all travel again and people are coming to France, but as an Australian French person, if you were sending an Aussie over to France, what would you recommend for them to do at a market? What would they, What should they buy? Considering they might not have, you know, access, they might be in a hotel with no kitchen or something like that. What should they go to the market and get and to experience that uh, French market life? I would just recommend to probably go and buy um, the tomate cœur de bœuf, you know, the big uh, tomatoes and um, with um, marinated olives because you can find the best olive for nothing. Like for two, three euro, you buy like this big bag of olives and they... Usually with um, North Africa, you know, all the spices, cumin and coriander and herb de Provence, um, which you can just put on your tomato with uh, just a fresh cheese, like a fresh goat cheese, a piece of bread, um, uh, eventually some fre- good ham from the market and just put that on the plate. That's why we usually do, you know, when we go to the market, we buy a f- few products we go and sit in a, in a cafe somewhere and we just eat the, the cheese or the saucisson. Like, I mean, people think it's a cliche, but it's actually not a cliche. That's what French people do. You, you just have a meal with a tomato, a little bit of olive oil, a nice goat cheese, a piece of bread and some fresh fruit from dessert like apricots or strawberries. You just eat them like that. You mentioned the it's the cœur bœuf uh, tomato. That, that's mm, right, isn't it? It's a really bœuf. big one. The cœur de bœuf. Cœur de bœuf, beef heart. <laughs> I don't know if you know in Australia, there is like the, the big pineapple. We have the big pineapple and the the big. Sh- I think there's a big shrimp, big shrimp and things like this. Why in France is there no big cœur de bœuf? Like you know, there needs to be or down in Menton, there should be a big lemon um, that you can go visit. Uh, there's none of that here. Maybe you can suggest it to your local council, Andrew. I think it would be a great addition to French culture. <laughs> So Ma- Ma- Morion, it is uh, known for its uh, macarons, actually. Uh, they have an almond macaron here. Mm. Uh, it's more like a macaroon. It's like it's shaped like a macaroon. It's not like the macarons that you get a macaron. I See, this is where I get confused. Um, macaron I, the difference and macaron. Between, um, uh, no, a macaron, a macaroon, and macron. And macaron. Um, I get them all confused. <laughs> um but um, I've covered this many a time, and old joke is a good joke. <laughs> I heard um, you about that one. I love uh, it. We have uh, the macarons that are they the they the shape of the macaroon, but instead of using coconut, they use almond, and they call it a macaron. Um, and so, yeah, so maybe we could have a big macaron here in Montmorillon. My um, dream house, I was talking about this this the other day, um, is that I would love to build a house that uh, was in the French countryside that was the in the shape of a croissant. Um, <laughs> but I think that I would get booted out, so I, I won't do that. Maybe I'll do that when I'm a bit older and I can I think and I can people would some give you a hard time about that. Huh? In France, they would they go, ah, oh, look at these Australian people are building a... I've learned, I've learned. I've been here long enough, uh, Slovenko. I've been here for five years. I know the, the rules. Just go and do it. You just, if you want to do this, you just do it and you wait for the council to come along and say, no, you can't. That's correct. That's correct. In France, um, in France uh, seasonality is, re- and we've touched on this quite a bit, but t- seasonality is really important for French food and the markets especially. Uh, even now in Australia or in France, what are your favourite product products and produce that you look forward to when they come into season? Like what is it that you really want to buy at a market when you know that you're getting it straight from somebody that makes it and it's fresh and you just can't wait? In France, I was looking, because I was in South, I was really looking at the melons and strawberries 
hundred percent because, you, like I said, the, the melons from Cavaillon is just amazing. Um, and you know what I was really looking forward to was the potimarron. Do you know what is a potimarron? Oh, we oui, the potimarron. We oui, oh, yes. La, yes la, okay. la, la. I used to uh -huh. make a puree of potimarron. It's just delicious. I miss that. And in Australia, um, look, I, I've got an amazing fruit stall, uh, Mick. His name is uh, the fruit detective. We call him like that at the, the market. He's the best. He's just sourcing the best fruit and veggies for from all different farms all over Australia. So I usually let him, let him guide me about um, the, the fruit that are in season. And he usually has amazing uh, mangoes and uh, pineapples, grapes. Lately on my um, veggie stall, they had amazing arti artichokes. Sorry about the pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, and they actually, they actually had uh, some um, tomatoes, like they were like cœur de bœuf. Oh. So I usually spend, uh, I take a lot of photos of the, of the fruits and veggies because it looks, the I love the colors, just uh, the aesthetic of it and the scents, yeah. Very quickly, I wanted to ask, because I've been me dying to ask somebody that is French, this question. But in relation <laughs> to a market, I've often seen at the markets, um, people will buy bags. And I mean, really quite large bags. I think it's the bags that the flower comes in. At the boulangerie part of store or the, the stall at the market or out of boulangerie itself, they will buy bags of baguettes. <laughs> And I'm confused. <laughs> What's going on there? What are they doing with so many baguettes? I mean, I just go and get one for the day so that it's nice and fresh. But who are you feeding that you buy 10, <laughs> you buy a bag full of baguettes? There might be 10 baguettes there. What's going on? Uh, I know exactly what you mean. Look, usually I think there's probably like for uh, actually schools and because as you know, Andrew, at the school, you have a little restaurant for lunch. Right. At school as well as university. At school, of course. Oh. My daughter was going to this, this school in the center of Nîmes and they had this amazing lady who was in her 60s cooking for them every day, like petit plat. They, she used to cook bœuf bourguignon, and couscous and ratatouille like it was the best i think it was four euro so, six so what happened when they went to australia and they went to school oh, in australia I, I got into i had a i went into depression the first year when i arrived to australia because they have a two hours break at lunch they go and sit in this massive room and you have the menu outside of the school that is printed for the week and they had like a salad of the whatever and then bœuf bourguignon cheese dessert <gasps> like every day the menu was amazing so when i arrived to australia and then i found out about the lunchbox <laughs> i was like what do you mean what do you mean a lunchbox what is it <laughs> and and since like for the eight five like the last five years yeah every morning when I do the bloody lunchbox, I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> the thing I hate the most in Australia, sorry for the word hate, it's no, pretty no, strong, wait, wait. but the thing I dislike the <laughs> most is the lunchbox. For me, it's a nightmare because I was raised with big tables and the, the lady, the cook that would come and just give me like fresh handmade, like, you know, home cooked puree with, it was not always good because we used to eat pretty like uh, beef tongue and oh. stuff that were like, or um, goat uh, brain. Oh no. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, we used to eat that. Apparently it was good for your health, but um, <laughs> apparently, um, but um, yeah, so when I arrived to Australia and still now, it's a big shock for me because to give a sandwich to my daughters, it was just like, I was like, my kids can't eat sandwich every day. I'm sorry, we are French. <laughs> That's not possible. So I, I had to go with it. But, uh, you know, I, 
I wish to reintroduce a proper canteen in uh, Australian uh, schools. <laughs> That's my program. <laughs> Slovik, merci beaucoup for being on Fabulously Delicious. Before you go, please tell us how can people find out about uh, Le Marché if they're in Sydney? So Le Marché, we are based in uh, Willoughby mm -hmm. and on the North Shore. So it's really very easy to access because we are, it's like 10, 15 minutes drive just after the Harbour Bridge. Um, we are in between two places at the moment because we are waiting for a DA <laughs> from the council, but we are in, a, in an amazing cottage called um, Laurel Bank in Willoughby, which is like being in a little French little house somewhere in the Loire Valley in a beautiful garden. And we are trading every second and fourth Sunday of the month from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Um, and like I said, there's everything you, you want, you can, you need for your grocery shopping. So we've got fruit, veggies, French cheese, saucisson, pâté, truffle products, um, uh, Mediterranean, uh, olives, olive oil. We've got two amazing French bakers. They are the stars of the markets. People queue, like we've got 20, 30 people queuing for them. Coming first thing in the morning, they bake some chouquette, baguette, croissant, uh, all the French specialty tarts. Um, and we've got crepes, um, raclette, croque monsieur, yeah, like uh, honey, uh, like fresh truffles, uh, madeleine, macaron, éclair, French chocolate. Like it's pretty, it's, it's, there's a good vari variety. And we've got also a few uh, artisans. So um, French products are handmade locally. Uh, it's so very unique. So during lockdown, we are, it's a bit tough to, to trade at the moment. Uh, so we are only open for food at the moment because we are still um, considered as essential services. I always say now that in Willoughby, croissant, baguette and saucisson are essential for the people living in Willoughby. Uh, essential services, right? yes. Well, of course... They are. Of course they are. Sylvix, so, thank you so much for joining us on Fabulously Delicious. You've been uh, truly amazing and given me, us all a great insight into markets in France. And uh, it's fabulous that somebody that uh, isn't, it's, oh, I think it's not only fabulous, but it's also very French, that somebody that considers themselves not to be uh, a very good cook is a fabulous foodie. And uh, so thank you so much <laughs> for joining us on Fabulously Delicious. Thank you so much, Andrew. Merci beaucoup. It was a Merci. great experience. I enjoyed it. Merci, oh. monsieur. Thank you very <laughs> much. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> What a fabulous interview with Sylvie Coulon from the Le Marche in Sydney. Sylvie gave us a great insight there into not only French produce and seasonality, but France markets in Provence and all over France, really, and such a great family history there. Thanks for joining us on Fabulously Delicious. If you liked this and like to support Fabulously Delicious, you can do so. You can just simply buy me croissant from Buy Me Coffee. The links are in the notes attached to this episode. So just check them out there, as well as the info for Slavig's Markets. So see. I'd like to apologise for last week. There wasn't an episode. We had a slight glitch, recorded a wonderful episode, and then at the end of it found that there was no sound. So that one will be coming to you soon. It'll be a fabulous interview with a gentleman down in the south of France who makes the fouille, which is a little known French flatbread. And uh, it will be a great episode. Coming soon though, I've got Gabrielle Gatte, as well as the wonderful Anne Ma. So I hope you can join us then on more Fabulously Delicious. And remember, I'm Andrew Pryor and my motto in life is, whatever you do, do it fabulously. So why don't you come listen to me on Fabulously Delicious, watch me go on Cooking Fabulously on YouTube, or just generally follow me around being fabulous. Why not? Loads of people do. Thanks for joining me and we'll talk to you next week. Okay, au revoir, à bientôt, and bon app.